So the question is, why do we need robotic hands to, to manipulate objects? The simple answer is, we humans use hands all day long, and we have the whole world shaped around hands. And the way we do this is that all tools, all objects that we create and that we care about are usually done in such a way that our hands fit them quite well. So that means as a robot, if we want to help us humans in a daily life interaction, we should have something that's similar to a human hands, because it has the same dimensions, it has the same size, capabilities of range of motion, where we move with our hands too, so that's why we need a robotic hands. Why would we have to have something else? Because it would actually not be able to do the whole variety, the whole range of objects that our hands can handle. So you might wonder, why don't we just take an industrial automation solution to solve all these tasks that we want to achieve with a complex robotic hands. The way you can think about this is, if you go into an industrial automation environment, those solutions that are being developed, they're usually made for tens, hundreds of thousands of objects. But very often we have to do smaller amounts of objects, like a human stands in a line, an assembly line, picks an object, has to do something to the object, like rearrange it or break something off, and then put it into a final location. The human is great at doing this. You can just change the, the task all the time. The human will then be able to adapt, but an industrial automation won't be able to adapt. So soft robotics is basically this field of going away from building robots with metals and motors towards building robots with more soft materials or combinations of soft and rigid materials to use them to our advantage of being more compliant, more adaptive to our unstructured world. Robotic hands have been around for a long time, so what does have soft robotics now to do with robotic hands? Well, when you build a robot, traditionally you use rigid metals, you use rigid links and rotating joints, and you bring them together with metal motors. And people have tried to build hands using that kind of approach of building a robotic five-fingered hand. But what they often have sort of like overlooked was that in, in, in humans, our hands, they don't use metals. They use a much softer set of materials such as bones, muscles, fat, skin. And all of these are way softer than these metals. So I think soft robotics is just sort of a short name for bringing in fluidity, bringing in compliance into the designs of our complex mechanical systems. And it has to be both in the rotational degrees of freedom, in the way that these bodies move, but also in the way that their whole surfaces are made of. So the traditional approach to building robotic hands would be take some metal constructions and put a motor in there, and then try to maybe put some soft padding on it, but that's not enough to be adaptive to a whole range of objects that we might show towards the hands. Our like robotic hand needs to be able to pick all of them up in the same series of uh, tasks. And so we need softness, not just in the skin, but also in the way that these hands move. And that's why we need soft robotics. You might wonder what crippers already exist in the market and what can they do for you? So there is a range of crippers. Some of them have less fingers, so they kind of only do a subset of what we can do with our human hands. Or there are crippers that have the same number of fingers as our human hands, five-fingered crippers. And the way they distinguish themselves is that they're either trying to minimize costs by less fingers or by using cheaper motors or cheaper components or by having the most high-end amount of materials in the cripper, but still lacking the compliance that we need or that we see in a human hand. That's one of the reasons why robotic hands haven't really taken off, because the crippers that have the highest level of complexity and they might be able to mimic already the motions of a human hand, those just cost too much. And the other issue is that these crippers still lack this compliance, the softness, both in the actuation of the cripper, the way that forces are being put into the cripper, and also in the way that the skins are made of these crippers. These very expensive crippers are precision machined, made out of metals and electric motors. 
But again, our human hand does not use any of these materials. We use bones, oh, we not necessarily use, we have bones and we have skin, muscle and other materials that are way softer than these metals. So this open space that doesn't exist in the market yet is this gripper that mimics the softness and the rigidity of our human hands while keeping the price to a level that anyone could afford buying such a hand to automate that problem. Yeah, so you wonder why would you need the level of complexity of a human hand? Five fingers, all these motion degrees of freedom. And the answer is that there is the aspect of handling our unstructured complex worlds, interacting with objects, interacting with tools. That just requires a hand that has many degrees of freedom, but also the inbuilt compliance and softness that we have in a human hand. And then you might say, why five fingers and not six or four or some any other number of fingers? And well, the answer is that we can actually imitate humans with a five-fingered hand, while if we go to any other numbers of fingers, the imitation will be much more challenging. Because humans are actually providing us in the internet with millions of hours of videos, them doing something with their hands. And we can learn from those videos. We have now the tools and understand what these hands can do and then translate that behavior onto our robotic hands. We are in the early days of doing this now, but that's really why we want to have good designs for five-fingered hands that are like a human hand. So the state of the art in robotic hand products and research is basically divided into simple hands or extremely complex hands. The market has this range of objects that are made of just a few motors and then when this motor actuates, it moves all of the fingers at once or it has these where you can actually control every single finger but then it costs you hundreds of thousands of Swiss francs. We already know of a few robotic hands on the market and so now what do we have to focus on? What are the remaining challenges that we have to overcome now, if the robotic hand can't do all of these motions that the real hand can do, we will have a really hard time to actually imitate human hand motions. That means we actually only left with those hand designs that have the same numbers of degrees of motion that a human hand has. And so we need something that at least is close to those degrees of freedom. That means we need to be able to flex our fingers and extend our fingers. We need to do adduction and abduction. And we also just need to be able to move our thumb around the same way as a human hand can. If you now bring soft robotics into the game, you have to rethink how you design these hands by using not metals, but using softer materials that imitate the rigidity of skin, muscle, tendons, ligaments, and bones. And so the challenge is really how do you make such a design? What materials do you use? How do you combine those things to make a hand that somewhat then mimics both the exterior sort of compliance in the hand, but also the compliance that we experience once we are attaching our hand onto another object or even into our second hand. The major goals for an ideal robotic hand should be that it becomes useful to our daily life. Being useful in our house, being useful at work, but also being useful in a logistic setup, in a healthcare scenario, in a manufacturing environment. And similarly, if I want to build a robot that can be in my house, the robot should be able to shake my hands. It should be able to do something like give me a hug. And so this design principle of building a robotic hand, which has at maximum sets of bones in it, and everything else is softer, will actually make this robot huggable. We can actually shake hands. If the arm has the same principle to it, then we can actually embrace this whole robot and feel like it's not some rigid metal machine, but it's actually something a bit more interactable. Everything that we do is usually an electromagnetic motor, which is a set of magnets, a set of copper coils that are wound, and then everything just spins, it rotates. And then we apply some mechanical tricks of making this rotating motion become a linear motion. And so if you think about the current leaders in the field, they are sourcing from 200 plus years of development in electric motors. 
and they then use that to build robots that are mostly driven by the task of being powerful, of being able to jump fast, of being able to go over rough terrain. But they're not so interested in making something that is safe to be in our daily environments. But they will have to do that and it is the next step for them for sure, but we're not there yet. People have tried to, in research, get closer to soft or hybrid rigid soft robotic hands. And what they try to do is they take fluids such as air or liquid and then they run them into basically rubber structures that can be inflated and deflated. And then they use that to either make a substitute to a real muscle using such an inflatable structure or they use it to directly build the fingers of the robotic hand using such structures. So the problem though is that you have to always start with a motor. The motor is what gets powered by a battery and then it starts spinning a pump. A pump will produce pressure and then that pressure has to run through like hydraulic or pneumatic lines that then go to your robotic hands. The length of what I just explained to you gives an idea about the number of different physical states you have to transition to in order to make something move. And that number of states will just basically increase the complexity and also the inefficiency of your system. So if you want something that is the same way as our human hand that has the hands and all the muscles that sit back here with its overall volume and its weight, you have no chance of doing this if you need to use pumps. So in the end of the day, we have to come up with a solution that uses something that acts and behaves and has similar properties to a real muscle. So the muscle sits down in here and it contracts, it's powerful, has endurance, and it's, we would call it very energy dense and power dense. And what people have tried so far was often focused on less energy dense and less power dense solutions that in the end are just so bulky that you may be able to make a hand, but not yet something that could go onto a robotic arm without being way too heavy. And so we call this field the biohybrid robotics field. And what we're trying to do in biohybrid robotics is that we take individual muscle-like cells and we use 3D printing to produce bigger muscle constructs. The 3D printing basically provides the structure and the sort of the matrix structure that these biological cells can grow in. And with this we are mimicking what a real muscle roughly looks like, while also trying to figure out how we give it nutrients, how we keep it protected, give it basically a packaging, a skin. And what's nice about this field of biohybrid robotics is that we can actually combine like non-living materials, artificial materials with these living materials and figure out a combination of those two. So we're actually moving in some parts of research, we're in the early stages of doing this, but we're moving in this direction of doing uh, engineering with living materials. So engineering with muscle cells and with other type of cells that are needed to build a functioning muscle that can contract, that can stay alive and that could replace one day our artificial muscles.